Say hallelujah. A lot of hand clapping going on in here tonight. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, that's not Taylor Swift. Come on, you don't clap your hands like you're at a Taylor Swift concert. You open your mouth when you worship God because the power is in your mouth. That's why the enemy, I got three people that get that. That's why you're a bad man when you're at home and when you come to church, you let your wife wear the pants. Open your mouth every once in a while, brother, and holler back at me because the power of life and death is in your mouth. Let me hear you holler yes. Shove that man sitting next to you and tell him he's talking to you, sucker, right now. He's talking to you right, right now. I want you to get your Bible in hand and momentarily I'm going to go to the book of Joshua. I must say that I came here to be a blessing to new life, but I am leaving here with new life having been a blessing to me. And I want to thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. You've been so very kind, so very kind to me, and I thank you for that. Um, and I must say that the praise and worship has been such a delight to be a part of. And, you know, there are some things you don't appreciate because you have constant exposure to it and you acclimate to it. But it would do most of you well to be forced to go to some of the churches I preach in for a service or two. <laughs> and you'd come back and you'd quit all of your nonsensical complaining about stuff that nobody else cares about but you. It's too hot, it's too cold, it's too loud, it's too soft. Yeah, 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 yeah. You change that after you visited another church for about two services. And well, if you're not gonna say amen to that, then I'm gonna say this. The people who demand the most are usually the people who give the least. So the next time you hear somebody, yeah, 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 you say to yourself, they're probably getting more out of this for a pound than anything else they've ever been to in their life. Because when you get invested, you tend not to complain and whine like that. You look for a way to make a difference. But um, just, you know, when I, the first service I was here, I thought, Pastor Jack has gone and done it again. He has chased off the entire praise team and thrown them out of the church. And then as service went after service, I realized there's so many people on the praise team that there's several different praise teams that are happening in here. And I've been waiting on the B team, but they never showed up this week. It's been the A team every night. You are blessed because of that. Why don't you put your hands together and thank God for all of the musicians and singers. I, I, don't even, I haven't even heard anybody who's a bad singer. I don't know how you do that. I mean, I know this is Belfast, but how do you get everybody to be a great singer? Sometimes we have some that are so bad, we unplug their microphone. I don't mean we turn it off. I mean we unplug it. We don't plug it in. And people say, why are they up there? And I say, because they're great worshipers. They dance. They, but if you get close to them, it's like somebody jamming an ice pick in the side of your ear. And everybody here has done such a tremendous job. And then, uh, you know, I was just, this all just crossed my mind while I was sitting there. If you've been in many meetings with me through the years, you know that I don't always follow the protocol that an evangelist follows. I don't always acknowledge the house and the pastor and everybody else because I'm there to do a job. But this just crossed my mind while I was sitting on the front row. Everything I have experienced this time at New Life has been excellence. I mean, from the parking lot to the praise and worship, I, I can't get in the church without 10 people trying to greet me and hug me and tell me, welcome to new life. And uh, I, I hugged the lady at our church a while back. She was brand new, and she jumped back. She said, I don't like for people to touch me. I said, well, I don't really want to touch you either, but we're at church, and that's what we do here. So get used to it, because there's going to be a lot of people hugging you before you get done tonight. Keep the hand sanitizer nearby. And uh, just a tremendous job on all of that. And the sound personnel, you're going to be shocked to hear this because all you see of me is my public persona, that docile teddy bear, so lovable you want to take him home with you. But when I work with the sound team, sometimes, you know, they get a little agitated and irritated with me. And I don't mind that. It. it gets me on my game. The madder I get, the better I am. But they have not 
been any problem to work with, and I, I don't even know. I've worked with so many different people. I don't know how you do it. If I had that many different people running the sound at my church, I believe I would just quit the ministry because I work with one and try to get them right and never feel like I get it exactly right. And every time I look up and somebody's new in the sound booth, I think, you're kidding me. Here we go again. We've got to start all over again. First thing, what does this mean? That means louder. First thing, what, second thing, what does this mean? Nothing, because I never do that. I'm always doing this. Don't worry, it's never going to be that. <laughs> but these guys have been phenomenal. Well, how about one time for the audio-visual team doing a great, great job? My life has been filled with intense moments like I've had with you this week. You get to know people so well that you feel like family, and just when you feel like you can't stand them any longer, you leave. And... Um, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. You got family too. Yeah, I've met some of your family, so you ought to say amen. And uh, everybody here has just been superlative in their treatment. I give a shout out to your streaming team. I, I don't know how they make it all work, but I've been watching it. And literally, you may not know this, but thousands and thousands of people around the world have watched every service that goes on at New Life. And what a blessing to have people who are attentive to that. And I'm going to be honest, I can't manage my own social media. If you want a response from me, say something stupid, because I will respond to that and dress you down in front of God. And in the whole world. But if you just say nice stuff, I tend to not respond. It's too much going on. But your, your people here responded to people who were commenting, except for the people who said how awesome I was. They didn't respond to that. I don't really know why. But they responded to other queries that were in, in live stream. And so I commend all of them for that. And, uh, and, and these are just things that crossed my mind a moment ago. I haven't made any notes to thank anybody. But all of that is because of a visionary like a Jack McKee. I remember when I first started coming here and the very limited resources that Pastor Jack was working with and to have a front row seat to watch what has happened in this church for more, uh, well, close to two decades that I've been coming here. It's a remarkable thing and it doesn't happen everywhere. And I salute you, Pastor Jack, as the visionary in this house. We love you. Pastor Johnny doing a tremendous job. Every time I see you, bro, I'm just so impressed. You've always, it seems to me like you've been full of the word of God. And every time I see you in the pulpit, it's a next level. And what a blessing it was to us at the river last year to have you come and be a blessing to our church. We love you. You're a part of our family. And it doesn't matter to me that you are older than me. You feel like my brother. You feel, you could be, you look like you could be my dad, but you feel like you're my brother. I appreciate that. Can I do one more song before I start preaching tonight? And really, I was going to make some more great protestations about how I wasn't going to preach long tonight, but we see how that worked out last night. I really don't feel like I have much to say tonight and maybe just a little icing on the cake. I feel like I've had the greatest week at New Life I have ever had. So if I disappoint you tonight, go back and watch the live stream because... God said some things over the last few services that I know was God because I never said them before and didn't plan to say them then. But the Lord has spoken to us because this is a strategic time for this church, for this city. Belfast needs you. And if you don't understand that, you're not going to understand this. The world needs you and they need what you're doing here. They're looking to you. And I see the healing that's happening in this city because of this ministry. And I love every time I drive through the open gates at nighttime, I know that that is a part of what God's done through this church. And I'm just excited. And I know preachers all over the world who have marched in the street with a cross because Jack McKee did it. They don't need a Bible or a verse. They're just doing it because Jack McKee did it. And revival is happening all over the world because of this church. Aren't, isn't it exciting to be a part of something like that? That's as... as uh, as the best, um, uh, the best three-man band in the world said, ZZ Top, you're bad and you're nationwide. Um, we're going to, oh, oh, I forgot, there's some safe folks here. They don't know who ZZ Top is. I apologize. We're going to open our Bibles momentarily. That was for the live stream and the folks back in Texas that are watching. LaGrange, Texas. Uh, Joshua chapter 5 in just a minute. I said I'm going to do another song. Let me do, let me do that. And uh, I want to mention again, 
it's, it's, um, we put some fresh things on the table uh, last night or today. Somebody did. I don't know where it even came from, but there's more of it out there. And um, I've been asked about this message because I've referenced it so many times, and who knows, I may do it again tonight before I get through. There are two things that I think need to be redefined in the world, and one of them is the local church. I, once pre- I preached a message in here. I'll never forget preaching it because Pastor Jack keyed off of it to launch a new ministry in this church. I preached on the city of the cities of refuge. And uh, in that, I suggested that we have to redefine what the local church is in the community. And I think that this church is a model of, of what the cities of refuge were intended to be. In this series that I call The God We Imagine, I submit that we need to redefine who God is to a generation. Because the most prolific idol worshipers in the world are not the ones that are setting in the jungles of Asia or Africa, but it's those of us setting in the Western churches that are worshiping not the God of the Bible so much as the God we imagine him to be. I'll tell you three things that we imagine about God. The first thing is we imagine a God who never gets angry with us. We imagine a God that never gets angry with us. We imagine a God who is easily controlled. We live how we want to, do what we want to, throw 50 pounds in the plate on Sunday and think we've got it all worked out with God. My brothers and sisters, I want you to know there is a God in the Bible who clearly defines himself as a God who loves us but is a jealous God. And you'd be amazed what would happen in your life if you would just line up what you think about God with who God actually is. You would see so many problems dissipate in your life. That's in this series we call The God We Imagine. And I was going to tell you the third thing, but Lynn has made me so nervous that I've now forgotten. <laughs> I, I remember now. I, I remember now because my wife, re- hearing from my wife while I'm staying in this pulpit and she's watching at home, reminded me of the third thing is we imagine a God we understand. Have you noticed that being around spirit filled people? They claim to understand everything about God. And when they don't understand everything about God, it drives them mad. I just need a word. Somebody, please, Pastor Johnny, do you have a word? Pastor Jack, I just need a word. No, because sometimes a word wouldn't help you because God is so great you cannot understand everything there is. See, you're looking at me like I've lost my mind because we imagine a God that makes sense to me. Well, it just doesn't make sense to me. Come here real close. I've been married for 28 years and women don't make sense to me. I love them. That's why I married one. You got to clarify that these days. But I don't understand them. Does anybody hear what I'm talking about? I don't worship God because I understand him. I worship him because he is God and he is God all by. Well, I wish I was preaching that, but there it is, Lynn. I cannot get caught. I I can't get caught. In that bloody melee. I was once preaching the Elam uh, Missionaries Conference in Houston. And there's like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of preachers there. And I held that up like that. And I said, I'll give it to the first person that gets it out of my hand. And I turned to look back. And when I looked up, they clocked me on either side and drew blood out of my forehead right over here. <laughs> this is some of you people are so cheap. They're just 15 pounds. <laughs> Pastor Jack. And if you buy at least three of them, you can get them for 10 pounds a piece. And if you're that tight, get a couple of friends to go in on you. I've been meaning to mention this the last two nights and got tied up with other things. This is the only thing on the table that is not preaching. It's teaching. And it is actually only 10 pounds. This is called VIP leadership training. Pastor Jack gave me the privilege of meeting with some of your leadership team here locally on Sunday. And I, I see in this house so many people that God wants to move into a place of leadership. Not necessarily in the church, just in the world, in the marketplace, in business, in life. And you have to get beyond just a survival mentality as a Christian like, oh, 
oh, I'm fighting the devil. If I can just survive this. If you move beyond that, you will become an influencer in society in the way that God needs us to be. You can open up doors in all kinds of places. And so my experience in ministry is unique in that in America, most people who call themselves a church planter are actually a church splitter. I'm sure they don't do that here. But where I come from, when they get ready to plant a church, they just get a few disgruntled people from one church, move to another location and call it a new church. But I come from a family of church planters. My, my parents planted eight different churches on the south side of Chicago when there were no white people doing that at that time. And it is now the largest multicultural church on the south side of Chicago. That's been my whole life. Cheryl and I came to Houston with no people, no money. There's nobody in our church that we knew when we came to Houston. We just started winning people, and 70% of our people are folks that we've won to the Lord. So I have a unique perspective on leadership that might help you. And then I'm scared to say it, but I will give this to the first person who wants to come and take it out of my hand. You can thank you very much. And I saw the action in the back. Thank you for encouraging me. That's nice. Get your Bible open to Joshua chapter 5 if you don't mind. And in the sound room, if you will hit that next track. I want to sing my favorite song tonight because of a conversation I had last night with somebody. And I think this might encourage you to know that whatever's happening in your life, you can make it. You will make it. You are making it right now. I thought number one. Would surely be me Thought I could be What I wanted to be I thought I could live On life sick and sand But Lord I can't even walk Without you holding my A lot on my own Thought I could make it All alone I thought of myself As a mighty big man But Lord I can't even walk Without you holding my Lord, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Oh, the mountains too high and the valleys too wide. But down on my knees, I've learned to stand. And Lord, I can't even without you holding my hand you're gonna be all right you're gonna make it through this your best is up next here's my testimony right here listen to this mm -hmm. so I guess I'll give Jesus my all and all on when I'm in trouble on his name I'm gonna call and if I don't trust in him I'd be less than a man cause Lord I can't even walk without you holding my hand if you know it sing it with me Lord I can't even walk without you Without you holding my hand Oh, the mountain's too high And the valley's too wide But down on my knees hey, I've learned to stand And Lord, I can't even walk Without you holding my hand. Oh, down on my knees. Hey, I've learned to stand. And Lord, I can't. 
can't even walk Lord, I can't even walk Without you holding Holding my hand Oh, yeah Oh, yeah Lord, hold my hand. Hey, yeah. Oh yeah. Amen. Everybody that can stand, would you please stand with your Bible open? And by that I mean only the old and infirm should keep their seat. Everybody else who has working legs, let's stand on them and open our Bible. To the book of Joshua, I will read, I will pray, and I will set you back down. I am delighted tonight, honored to have uh, Gail Hunter uh, as my guest. If it were not for Gail Hunter, I would never have been introduced to Pastor Jack McKee. Uh, she was uh, the first person in this wee province, as you say, to believe in our ministry and promote us. And thank you for that, Gail. She's introduced us to, us to some great churches around the world and been a very kind and generous friend to us. And I had the honor of dedicating her eldest child to the Lord. Thank you for taking time to be here tonight. She's in the middle of writing a 30,000 word essay for her masters and it's due in like three days. So I don't even think I have 30,000 words to give you tonight, but write fast <laughs> and see what happens. Joshua the fifth chapter and the second verse. Is anybody here for a word from the Lord tonight? I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says, At that time, the Lord said to Joshua. Now, listen, I'm the kind of guy that doesn't read 10 verses when I preach because I think almost every single word means something. There are particular times when you read sacred text that you have to understand the word the means something important. The word of means something important. And as I read this text, I wish I had time to break this all the way down. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, because I believe that new life, indeed Belfast, is at a particular time where you have opportunities before you that we have never had in our lifetime. And I want the revival fire that is kindling in this church that we talked about last night, in spite of the snakes, to explode and spread throughout this land and for you to transport this fire around the world. And the Lord said to Joshua at this time, I'm, the New King James says, make flint knives for yourself. Here, I think the Old King James gives us better clarity. It says, make sharp knives for yourself and circumcised the sons. Let's just back that train back in the station one more time because the sharp knives didn't matter till we read it involved circumcision. So let's just read that one more time. The Lord said, make sharp knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, Oh, you're going to have to do better than that tonight, or we're going to go round and round tonight. Look at your neighbor, look him right in the headlights and say, neighbor, if you're going to cut me, make it sharp. I want to preach in the time allotted to me tonight on uh, the final cut. Father, thank you for your presence. Uh, now, as I stand before your people in this grand finale, I pray for an open heaven over this place. That you would make a liar out of the devil and you would loose the Holy Ghost in this house tonight. Now Satan, the Lord rebuke you. The blood is against you. You're a liar. You're defeated and cast down. You don't have any power, hold, or influence over anybody in this room. We bind you in Jesus' name and we loose the Holy Ghost. Everybody that's in agreement, say amen. God bless you. May be seated. The final cut. I'm going to come back often to this text as it rests on the sacred desk in front of me tonight because I'm about to begin recording this series at home and I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to say when I record this series at home, which means I'm even less sure of what I'm going to say here tonight. But I have been in this text all day today and the Lord has stirred some things in my spirit that are not just for recording this series at home, but they are for this house and for this time. Everybody shout, this time. 
Uh, as we insert ourselves into the text, I think that um, one of the first things we need to be reminded of is who Joshua is and what the time frame is. By the time we get to this point in the text, a whole generation has died off that escaped Egyptian bondage but was not quite able to believe God to get to the land of promise. See, there's so many things to preach on the way to where I'm going that if I'm not careful, I'm going to get distracted because I just have a little thing to say to you. And I don't want to say so much on the way to that little thing that I overshadow the little thing with a lot of big distractions. But I must point out to you, I find it tragic that there are people who come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. They are delivered from Egyptian bondage, if you will, but they never quite make the trip to what God had designed as their optimal life. I'm going to preach that till I get a little help. I feel like it's a little tight in here tonight because some of you are those people. You escaped Egyptian bondage. You got set free. You got delivered. You found Jesus as your savior, but you are not now living the life for which you were designed. You are caught up in a sort of purgatory halfway between where God brought you from and where God's trying to take you to. That's why we're in here on a Tuesday night. Sunday morning isn't good enough for us because we were not satisfied with where we were when God delivered us and we know that God has more for us now than just walking through a dry place there's a promised land on our horizon I wish I had time to preach right there about going through that dry place because as I alluded to last night, there are times you realize after you become a follower of Jesus life is tougher now than it's ever been now the church folks not going to say amen because we're trying to sell you sinners on following Jesus and we don't want to confess to you that times are tougher now than they were before we got to Jesus. Sometimes after you become a follower of Jesus, after you get free of your bondage, you find yourself just like Israel did on a short 11 day journey from their past to their promise, but it's drier than it's ever been in your life. And if you don't keep your eyes on the prize, you like the children of Israel will start murmuring about where you came from. My life wasn't this tough before I started following Jesus. Just shove that whiner sitting next to you so they know we're, that we're talking about them right now. Life wasn't this hard before I joined the church. Things weren't this difficult before I got baptized. I hear what you're talking about, but it's because you are in a time of transition where you are coming out of your past and God is preparing you for your promise. And even though you're going through the driest place you've ever been in in your life, be encouraged to know this, that on the other side of this dry place is the greatest thing that God has ever done in your life. I'm going to preach that for 30 more seconds and see if I can get some of you deadheads on board with this. We have bought into this goofy idea that if it's good, it's God. If it's bad, it's the devil and he's real nasty, y'all. No, there are some things that are distasteful to you on the front end. But on the back end, it's the greatest thing that ever happened in your life. I heard one American preacher, this is why you need to steer clear of Americans, America's most poisonous export, Christian television, because they say stuff that if you had just been to vacation Bible school, you'd know it's a lie. You don't even need a theology degree to figure out that they're morons. I heard one preacher say, God never sends anybody to the desert. And I said, I can't tell you what I said, you'd be offended at what I said. I said bad words that Christians should not say. And I said them out loud and I yelled at the television. I took my shoe off and I threw it. I said, God never leads anybody to the wilderness. Who gave this clown ordination papers? God led the children of Israel right into the wilderness. Jesus was led by the spirit of God right into the wilderness. Paul went right in. I'm about to get myself happy. I came to preach to somebody tonight that's in the wilderness right now. The devil didn't do that to you. God brought you there to get you ready for the greatest thing that has ever happened in your life and when you come out of your wilderness you will not be back in Egypt where you came from you'll have the greatest anointing you have ever had you will be in the greatest place you have ever been in your life somebody shout I'm coming out 
Here is where we find ourselves in this narrative. And Joshua, young Joshua, has now assumed the leadership. And it's important to understand that not only has a generation died, but their leader has died. And young Joshua has arisen to take the helm in place of Moses. And Joshua is now hearing from God on how to make their move forward. And God says, that he's uh, later in this same fifth chapter, he says to Joshua, I have to keep a promise that I made to your fathers. Can I preach right there for two minutes? Because some of you are thinking way too small. You are asking God to get back what you lost. And God says, I was going to give you back what you lost, what your father lost, what his father lost. You don't hear what I'm talking about. It was probably some folksy little American who wrote the country gospel song, Give Me My Mountain. And you got Joshua and Caleb going back and say, Give Me My Mountain. But Joshua and Caleb never said, Give Me My Mountain. They came back to the land of promise, put their foot down, and said to the enemy, I have come for all of the land that God swore to my fathers. Listen to me, Jack McKee. You got to think bigger. It's not just what the devil took from you. It's what the enemy took from generations in this land and somebody has to put your foot down and say I want it all back not just what you took from me but what you took from my family what you took from my father what you took from my father's father I want it all back shout that out I want it all back because some of you are about to sell out and you're going to settle for the little bit that you lost and what you lost isn't even worth getting back. You never had much to begin with. But if you would stand up tonight and tell the devil, go to hell, I want it all back. I want back the wealth that you took from my family. I want back the wisdom that you took from my family. I want back what God promised to my fathers. Shout it out. I want it all back. God says, in order for you to take it all back, you have a generation. Some of this I alluded to maybe two nights ago in preaching, I don't recall. You have a generation who is uncircumcised now. They were born in the time of transition, and they have never been circumcised. And I cannot give you the victory unless you have an army of circumcised sons. My brothers and sisters, could I submit to you that we have raised a generation that knows how to run the lights and the sound and the programs, but they know very little of the consecration of circumcision that is required for us to march as the covenant sons of God and demand that the enemy return to us everything that belongs to us. And even as I tell you that, let me tell you, that the tool is there waiting to be used. It just has to be called upon. Joseph was a tool that God was going to use in order to sustain and bless his people. But Joseph spent time in prison until somebody called up the tool until somebody said bring me that gift as I said to you just nights ago you're praying for God to give you a gift to meet your need and you don't understand that you are the gift to meet a need that God is tailor making just for you and when you get plugged into that need you're going to realize I wasted time crying because I wanted a gift from God and I just realized I am the gift from God to meet somebody else's need that's what I believe, Pastor Johnny, about this generation that God is raising up. They are a gift from God. They are a tool that God has given in the earth to evangelize the nations. But in fact, we have to prepare that tool for what God wants to do. Everybody say sharp knives. And so in the text that I submitted to you tonight, the Lord says to Joshua, we have to circumcise these men. And then you can go back and take the land that I have promised to you. Now, I want to just pause for a minute and remind you that in the New Testament, we are aware of the fact that circumcision is not the physical circumcision. It is the circumcision of the heart. 
And I believe we're dealing with a generation that is so callous that in order for us to be able to circumcise them, we are going to have to have a sharp tool, a sharp gift in the house that is ready to, 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 to circumcise the hearts of the people. I believe with all of my heart that the generation that sits in this room tonight is the generation that God is calling to be the knife that will circumcise the generation that is not yet in the house. He will use us to slice away their stony heart and give them a soft heart ready to receive the things of God. We cannot do that while we are dull we cannot do that unless God has sharpened us and so I want to cut right to that because to be as brief as I can I just want to get to that process because that's what the Lord's been dealing with me about today the process of sharpening us so that we can be used to circumcise a world that has a hard heart towards the church In order for us to slice away that stony, hard heart, God has to sharpen us in order for us to be able to perform that kind of surgical maneuver on them. Does that make sense to you? And there are just three things that I want to leave with you and then I want to pray over you. Not for you to get a miracle, but for you to be the miracle tonight. The first thing that I learned about sharpening knives is that it demands resistance. Oh, well, nobody going to say amen right there. Because we like to pray out all the resistance in our life. I'm about to lose my mind up in her. I need the Lord to get these people off of my job. I need the Lord to get these people out of my life. If you didn't like that, you're going to hate this. I just wish they'd go to church somewhere else because they resist everything we do. God sends resistance to strengthen you and he sends resistance to sharpen you. Now watch me right here, Pastor Johnny. I'm going to help you with something because you don't look bad for your age. But I can help you do something with the frame. You know what I mean? And uh, so you don't look like a box when you're walking down the street. I want to give you a little, watch this right here. All right. Because um, when, when, when I uh, lost 100 pounds and, and, and uh, for many years I, I kept my weight at 170 pounds in a 32 inch waist, I discovered that I had to have some definition. It wasn't enough to lose weight. I had to have definition. And so, which meant I had to, first of all, strengthen my muscles and then define my muscles. You're not going to like this. I know that already because I already tested you. But I'm going to tell you because you need to hear it. The reason many of you are weak as water is because life has been too easy for you. Oh, I knew you weren't going to like it. No, no, no. Your mama was always looking out for you. She was down to the school getting into it with the teachers and fighting with the police for you. And Somebody's always trying to make an easy way for you. And so here you are now, 40 years old, and having a nervous breakdown every time you face any difficulty in life. Just just keep looking straight ahead. Don't look at them. My God, you're going to make everybody look at them. And the reason for that is you haven't had enough resistance yet. When you ought to be praying, you're crying like a little schoolgirl who missed the last bus going home. Pastor Jack, I'm about to lose my mind. Over what? Because you have never had resistance. So watch this, Johnny. Because I see you sit there night after night. You look at me and you say to yourself, how do I get that body? Why do I, what do I do? I see it in your eyes. And I know it's especially painful for you when I cut a profile because you see the pecs popping out of the shirt and you say to yourself, where did I go wrong? What am I not doing? I'm going to help you. Because when I first lost the weight and I started to put on muscle, they said, in order for you to put on muscle mass, you have to deal with resistance. If you hire a personal trainer, Pastor Tony, the first thing they want to know is how much resistance are you working with right now? I can tell by looking at the arms. We call them guns in the gym, Pastor Johnny. I can tell by looking at the arms of everybody in this room how much you're resisting. And some of you, not much. 
And the only thing that's going to make you stronger is more resistance. You know why you don't know how to pray very well? Because you hadn't had much resistance. You know why you don't know how to worship when you don't feel like it? Because you haven't had much resistance. Watch the people who have been to hell and back. They're the first ones on their feet. They're the first ones to clap their hands. They're the first one to shout hallelujah. And you think you have problems? No. You don't have problems. You're just a punk because you never had any resistance resistance but once you have to fight the devil and you come up swinging you know this he took me down but when I got up I was stronger than I was when this I came the night to tell somebody in this house when this battle is over you are going to be stronger than you have ever been in your life resist the devil and he will flee you know why he flees when you resist him? Because he sees that what he's doing is not hurting you. It's helping you. Gravity resists me when I lift weights. The enemy resists you when you're working for God. And then he sees that you're getting stronger. He sees you develop resistance. And the enemy flees to somebody else who is not willing to resist him. You know why I'm here tonight when I'm too sick to be 5,000 miles away from home and sweat like this? Because I found out if I resist the devil, he will run away because he finds out he's making me stronger. Lie about me if you please. You're just making me stronger. Steal from me if you want to. You're just making me stronger. Talk about me if you like. You're just making me stronger. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Shove that dead head next to you and tell him you're making me stronger, man. I know you're talking about me, but you're making me stronger. I know you're stabbing me in the back, but you're making me stronger. I know you're whispering about me, but you're making me stronger. Resist the devil. This is the thing that is required to sharpen a knife. Resistance. Some people are dumb as a box of rocks. Because they constantly pray the resistance out of their life. Lord Jesus, please take it away. I can't take it anymore. I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to come here tonight. I will not be praying for anybody to have the resistance removed. Because you need resistance to sharpen you. Now listen, I imagine there are several men and probably a lot of ladies in here that know much more about sharpening a knife. I've actually never sharpened a knife. I've just seen videos of knives being sharpened. But resistance can come in a number of forms. Water, diamonds, iron. All of these things can provide the resistance to sharpen a knife. But what's important with the resistance is it has to be positioned at the proper angle. Is there any part of the Bible you like? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a part you'll say amen to, and so far I'm not there. Ask him to get the puppets ready for me out of kids' ministry. I, because some of you don't say amen to anything. Iron sharpens iron. But that, that's, that doesn't mean... God sends a bunch of awesome people around you that sharpen you. That means God sends people you want to punch in the face. Don't, don't look at your husband when I say that. Don't, don't quit staring at Pastor Jack at the back of his head. It's not fair. He can't even see you. Watch this. God sends people to resist you. You're not going to like this. But people who are not properly positioned cannot resist you. They can only endorse you, and that's part of the reason you're crazy. Because everybody has endorsed everything you've done all your life. I heard you, Pastor Jack. Everybody's always told you how awesome you are, and nobody's ever questioned you on anything. 
And because you have not been questioned, you have not been resisted, you have not been sharpened. And so when resistance comes, you have no ability to respond to it because you are as dull as a butter knife. God sends resistance in a proper alignment. If iron sharpens iron, let's be frank in the interest of time. Let's dispense with breaking that down and just say people sharpen people. But in the worst possible way. He positions them in a way that they cause you resistance. That's why you have to work with who you have to work with. That's why you, you go to school with the people you go to school with. That's why you go to church with the people you go to church with. God sent them in your life and then put them in the worst possible position to drive you out of your ever-loving mind. But when you see them on your way to work tomorrow, or maybe when you lay down in bed next to them tonight, just roll over and kiss them and say, I love love you baby you are making me sharp I'm sharper now than I was when I met you I'm sharper now than I was last week so try practice right now tell your neighbor you're making me sharp right now I think the next thing that I see in this text after God uses people at the proper angle, angle to sharpen us is that God ha has to uh, do like you do when you sharpen a knife. God has to raise a burr. This surprised me when I read in the steps of sharpening a knife because in order to raise a burr, you actually have to remove metal. You actually have to remove metal from the edge of the knife. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, that in the process of God sharpening you up to circumcise the hearts of the uncircumcised, there are things in your life that God is going to have to remove. I'm going to preach that until I get some help. Who you are now is not literally going to cut it. Who you are now is not going to cut it. God is going to have to remove something from you in order to sharpen you up. And in the process of raising that curly edge on the steel of sharpening that knife it first of all creates a deformation it literally deforms the metal I'm preaching to somebody in here tonight who is not only not recognizable to your friends you are no longer recognizable to yourself when you look at your life you think this is not me this is not who I used to be I don't even know myself anymore God sent me 5,000 miles to tell you you haven't missed it you haven't blown it God is just getting you ready and as he's getting you ready it's deforming you right now it's changing your look right now it's changing your attitude right now and when you get done parts of you are going to be missing but you will be an effective tool in the hand of God when he gets done with you Because as you raise the burr, it doesn't just deform you. It literally takes from you things that have been a part of you. And a man who sharpened knives told me that the only way to raise a burr is that you have to grind it until you raise a burr to confirm a sufficient amount. In other words, it's got to be enough that you can see it. God keeps grinding on you until you can no longer disguise the deformity. He keeps grinding on you until you can no longer pretend everything's okay. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but there's a few people in here who have been ground almost to powder, and you used to be able to sit in the house and act like, oh, that's awesome, that's great preaching, but now you have been so deformed by the process that we can't get through one song until you're crying your eyes out. Preacher can't give the invitation, and you're already rushing to the altar. Not many people understand that, but I have been right there where God is sharpening you and he just keeps grinding until he has raised a burr in you and then he's got to keep grinding until that old edge is removed once he raises the burr he's got to keep the pressure on until he gets it out of me because sometimes the old attitude remains sometimes the old mindset remains sometimes the old ideas remain but God grinds it until the old edge edge is removed and not only am I sharper but the sharpness is due to a brand new edge that God put in me an old man 
An old man told me that the secret to the sharpest knives is in raising a burr. And then I learned this. Because there are people who do not want, Pastor Johnny, to submit to the process of being sharpened. And they think they're special because they have a gift. They have a talent. So they don't have to go through what you go through because they're smarter than us. But I learned that if you raise, if you sharpen a knife without raising a burr, without deforming it, without removing a part of it, firstly, it never cuts as sharp as the knife that has been properly ground. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, we see it all the time in preachers and singers particularly, but it's really everywhere in life. People who have gone through nothing and seem to have such talent and ability. And you wonder, why are they not more effective? Why are they not more influential? It's because they never let the edge be ground off of them so that God could sharpen them. And there is a difference. Because on occasion, somebody comes to sing who can hardly carry a pitch in a bucket with a handle and a back strap on it. But when they open their mouth to sing, you feel that warm, oily mix of anointing pour over your life. And you know that's somebody that got ground all the way down to raise up a burr and cut it off to make them sharp. Here's the other thing. If you don't raise a burr, the old timer told me that the sharpness to whatever degree it is sharp, will not last very long. Do I have a witness in here? Yeah. Have you ever seen anybody who didn't go through the process, Bradley, and they just don't last as long because they tried to get around the sharpening? And for whatever reason, doesn't look like they've been through more than anybody else. It doesn't look like life has been tough for them. But for whatever reason, they don't last as long as those of us who go through the process, the humiliating process of being deformed and being cut and being sharpened. And But when God gets through with us, we are able to last through the storms. We are able to last through the disappointments. We are able to last through the questions. And all of it is due to the process of sharpening that God puts us through. In fact, if the burr has not been raised, they wear it down quickly. You know what I'm talking about, Pastor Jack. The folks you got to jack up all the time. You got to encourage them all the time. You got to push them all the time. But you look at people who have been through the process of being sharpened by God. And those are the people who remain sharp when everybody else is losing their mind. They are the people who stick with the process when everybody else is discouraged enough to get up. I'm going to my seat now with this. Here's the last thing I saw in Joshua 2. Make the sharp knives and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. I discovered that there are people who get in the process of being sharpened. And they stop on the way to being sharpened. And because of that, if you've ever sharpened a knife, you know that when the burr gets raised, if you don't finish the process... It leaves behind a jagged edge that cuts recklessly. How many of us have known somebody that never let God finish the process in them? And as a result, they're dangerous to everybody around them. Their words cut recklessly. Their actions cut recklessly. And it's because God raised a burr on them, but he never let, they never let God hone it down to a smooth edge. They got through the process and became offended by somebody or something. Maybe you're that person sitting in this room tonight who started out serving the Lord and you were full of passion and fire for the Lord, but you got offended by an elder. You got offended by a pastor. You got offended by somebody. And right while God was using people to sharpen you, you said, I don't have to be talked like that. I don't have to be treated like that. You stopped midway through the process and it left you with a jagged edge and now you recklessly tear apart your wife, your kids, your friends. You are cutting recklessly because you never let God smooth out the jagged edges. See, it's not a smooth process. 
It only ends smoothly if you let God sharpen the knife. Because if God doesn't sharpen the knife, then what happens to you is that with that jagged edge, you don't have the ability to precisely do what God has assigned you to do. It's a terrible thing to hear a preacher that's had a burr raised on him and never had God smooth out the edge. And the mean-spirited things that can be said across a pulpit that injure people recklessly forever just because they didn't let God smooth out the edge. One of the things that I want to pray tonight when I open this altar is for those of you who have been injured in the sharpening process. You have been wounded in the sharpening process for God to smooth that out because there is a generation that needs your gift, that needs your tool. And in order for that to happen, he has to finish the process. The process is not complete until God has honed the edge, until he has smoothed out the rough edges. In other words, God has equipped you, but he hasn't finished honing you. And that's the reason why we keep coming to church. Because the teaching and the preaching and the prayer and the fellowship is honing the edge on me. There are many, many people around you in our world who are bitter, they're reckless, their edge is jagged. Because they started into the process and God sent somebody to resist them. And rather than, or some experience to resist them. And rather than allowing that experience to play out, they stopped halfway through the process. And now when you see them, they say, I haven't been to church in 10 years because this happened. I'm never going back to church again because that happened. There are people sitting in this room tonight who haven't been to church in a long time. Because you got in the process, but you didn't let God finish that process. And Joshua, God said to Joshua, I'm going to send you out to circumcise those sons, and then those sons are going to take back what I swore to your fathers. I've come here tonight with this assurance from New Life City Church. God is going to keep his promises in this city. Come on, praise team. I think I'm going to quit right there. I got more preaching, but I feel like God's ready to move. God's going to keep his promises to this city. But he's raising up in this house an army for the final cut that will circumcise the hearts of the people in this city and a generation that has come to believe that God is a joke will have their hearts softened before him by what he raises up in this house. But I wonder if you would let him finish that process in you. Beginning with what Pastor Pete preached on last Thursday night as I watched it back in Houston, Texas and then forgot about it as I came to the pulpit Sunday and preached something almost identical and then today as I sought God and saw him weaving these things together, I realized that the best thing we can do before I leave your city tonight is not for me to just get you happy jumping up and down, but for me to touch you and agree with you for God to finish the process that he has begun in you. Lift up your hands as the international sign of surrender. Wherever you're at in the world, if you put up your hands, it's the international sign of surrender. Lift up those hands and say, Lord, have your way. Do it your way. Finish the process. Say it to him. Finish the process in me.